There we go. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining our webinar. Um, as someone with ADHD, this has been such uh, an exciting thing to get to plan and do with two amazing uh, women uh, who just really know a lot about both Evernote and ADHD. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce them. Uh, so first of all, we have Leslie Josel. Um, she is an academic life coach for students with ADHD. I have already learned so much from her just getting to do a few phone calls. <laughs> uh, she blows my mind on a daily basis. Um, she does a lot of hands-on education guidance and virtual coaching. So you don't have to be where she is um, on getting help with um, organization, ADHD, planning with students, et cetera. So uh, thank you so much for being here. And also on the call today is my very good friend and Evernote certified expert, Kimberly Purcell. Uh, she is a productivity consultant who works with individuals who want to use Evernote better um, and improve their personal time management, work-life balance. Uh, it's been a really great honor and pleasure to put this webinar together for you all. So uh, without further ado, I will hand it over to them. So first of all, thank you so much, everyone, um, for having me. Um, I'm really excited to be here and to be speaking to the Evernote community. Um, and I'll tell you why as we move through how much I love Evernote. But what I want to say is we have a lot of people on this call, a lot of people on this webinar. So we are going to be hitting all ages. We have all ages and all stages. Um, so again, we're going to be taking like what I like to say that 36,000 level view. We're going to be exploring and digging into what executive functioning is. Um, so you walk away with a deeper understanding, as well as what I call my triple T, some tips and tools and techniques, as well as covering what we love so much about Evernote. Um, so let's get into it. There's a lot of information. So we're going to sit here for a while. So I kind of laugh and say, what better way to start a webinar by telling you what we're not going to be talking about tonight? <laughs> And what we're really not going to be talking about is ADHD. What we're really going to be talking about is executive functioning. And here's why. Um, as we all know, ADHD is not necessarily a hyperactive disorder. It's not a, you know, a focusing disorder. And in fact, we know with those of us with ADHD that we can focus when it's meaningful when it's not boring, when it's something we're super interested in. In fact, sometimes we are focused so much that we lose our focus. And that is actually what ADHD is. ADHD really is what we call lagging executive functioning skills, right? It is all about our self-regulation. So the other thing that I think is, and we're going to talk a little bit about that, but what I think is really important for everyone to know, and not everybody does, is that you can be diagnosed, when you are diagnosed with ADHD, you automatically have executive dysfunction. And for our purposes, we're just going to call it EF because it's just a lot easier and faster to say. However, the reverse is not true. You can be diagnosed with executive functioning challenges and not have ADHD. So when a lot of parents show up at my door and say that my, my child exhibits a lot of you know, EF challenges, they must have ADHD as well. Now, granted, I don't diagnose, but that is not necessarily true. So that's why we're actually going to be spending a lot of time on the EF pillars, because no matter what, if you have ADHD, you have EF challenges. So what is executive functioning? Let's go to the next slide. So this is a big definition. And actually, I like to say executive control. And you have to remember, I spend most of my days speaking to students and parents. So I tend to be very user-friendly in my language. I call it either parent-led or student-led language. But I like the word control because when I hear the word control, I feel like something called self-leadership. I have the ability to strengthen things. I have the ability to be self-aware. I have the ability to self-regulate if I learn certain tips and tools. So I feel like there's a lot of growth in the word control as opposed to the word function. That's just my, my way. But how I describe it is very simply. It's being able to do what you need to do 
or want to do when you need to do it in a manner that is right or correct or at the right time or with the right focus or the right energy, the right volume, right? The right cadence even just without and the right or not right distractions. So to drill it down even further, let's go to the next slide. It's being able to do purposeful actions. That's it, purposeful actions. And there's a great, I don't quote, that we say a lot in our world, which is, I can do, I know what it is I have to do, but I can't always do what I know, which is purposeful actions, because your EF challenges are getting in the way. And I love purposeful actions because I feel like it's a very visual way of seeing what might be going on underneath the surface. The other thing I like to say in here when we talk about EF is something I call being available. And again, I, I play in the field of parents and students mostly. And I get students who come to me and say, there's a lot of distractibility in my world. And they're not talking about external distractibility. We're talking about internal distractibility. And that's really a much more user-friendly way of saying self-regulation. It's hearing, it's like it's being overstimulated or hearing noises. And I don't mean it that way. It's just a lot of internal, internal distractibility, which then prevents you from being available to do what it is you need to do. So that's the first thing. So that's our executive function, literally in two words. But here's another, we're going to go to the next slide. But here's something else that is super important that I think most of us need to know now. If any of you have ever heard me speak, you'll know I don't do any webinars without talking about executive age. So this is really for my, I would say my young adults in the room and my parents. So when parents come to me and they say, my child is 13, they should be able to get out the door on time. My child's 16, he should be able to do homework on his own. There's a word in there that I like to get rid of, and that word is should. Because what we're talking about here are brain-based behaviors. So just because your child or you are a certain chronological age, it doesn't mean that your executive functions are going to be at that same age. And in fact, what it is is that if you have any, any kind of executive functioning challenges, like organization, time, effort, focus, working memory, impulsivity even, you're going to be 30% less your chronological age. So you might have that 13-year-old at home who's 13 in all their 13-ness, right? 13 athletically, academically, verbally, okay? I'm gonna put my hands up for that one. But if they are time blind or they have weak working memory, they're going to be nine. So let's go to the next slide. And how you are going to scaffold that nine-year-old or what you're going to expect, even from yourself, if you're in your late 20s or even your early 30s, because our executive functions actually do not um, fully come to be until our mid-20s. And some researchers are now saying even later. There is a great divide, right? Just look at my example for 13. That's an 8.6. Now, remember what I said. These are not absolutes. Not everybody shows up in the same way. But yes, this is what we mean by lagging executive skills. Now, can we catch up? Can we strengthen the brain? Absolutely. So what we're going to do now is we're going to kind of go through what I like to call, we picked like five pillars of executive functions. We're going to talk about them. And I'm going to give you some tips and tools, including some of the things that, that Evernote does that really plays to helping strengthen or support that executive functioning brain. So let's go to the next slide. And let's talk about our first pillar. So our first pillar is organization. And some of you might be kind of scratching your head going, really? Time management under organization? And I'm here to tell you, yeah, yes. <laughs> and here's why. Because it's not only the ability to keep track of our things, right? 
in space or our stuff. It's also about time. If you are time blind, that is actually a disorganization, right? So if you don't know where you sit in time, or if you that's going to be the equivalent of feeling like unmoored, right? Like you're going to feel a little confused and a little unsteady and might feel cluttered in your brain. What time is it? How much time do I have? All of that clutter. So yes, time and organization actually go hand in hand as our executive functions. So let's go to the next slide. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on organization because I know that probably of all of our executive functions, organization is probably the one that there is more information on, more stuff out there. But I want to give you a little bit of how I look at it, just my rules of thumb, you might say. It is always calm over chaos. The brain craves calm. And when I talk about it with parents and students, I talk about cubbies versus shelves because shelves are long and unwieldy and cluttered. And you might not be able to see beginning, middle, and end. What I love about, now this is not necessarily literally, I even talk about cubby sizing information. So I love Evernote because we can put parameters around it. We can see it, right? We can see a beginning, middle, and end. And most importantly, we can find it. So we want consistent routines. We want places for things. And it doesn't only mean things that are like, tangible, like our clothing or books or kitchenware, we're actually seeing more and more where people are having trouble having, having places for information, that snippet they want to keep, that video they saw, that dress they might want to buy. So that's what we mean by we need structure. We need places to hold things. Everything needs a home. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So a quick few rules of thumb. For most of us who have challenges with organization, this is what we see. If you do not see it, it rarely exists. There's a funny thing, we call it filers or pilers, revealers or concealers, right? So if we don't see it, if it's not out, if it's not in our eye line, it doesn't exist. That's why when I started my started doing this 19 years ago, the very first thing I ever did, because my son was the one who had ADHD and how I started this business is I took the closet door off in his bedroom because I realized what was the door was a barrier to entry. So we want to make sure that what we need and what we, or not even what we need, even what we want is in our eye line, that we remove those barriers to entry so we can see them. If it takes us more than two or three steps to do something, the likelihood that we're going to do it kind of starts to diminish. And what I mean by that is having to take multiple, multiple steps to find something. Clear is always king or queen, always. Making it clear, making it visible, making it easy to find, and then labeling or using color for everything. So we're going to go to the next slide, and we're going to talk a little bit about my favorite thing. So let's go to the next slide. So like I said, I work with students morning, noon, and night. And I mostly actually work with college students. And their brains, I don't have to tell you, their brains are full. There's a lot that they have to keep track of. So here's one I love because what tends to give them problems is, okay, I have to find, I have to find the website for my professor. I have to find that syllabus. Right. And you're going to laugh because a lot of adults think syllabuses have gone the ages. Oh, no, they haven't. We are still getting syllabuses in college. They're still they're still thick. They're still, you know, they're big and heavy and dense. But we need to have them in a place that we can access them because all the details are in there. We need to see our assignments. We need to see what we're shopping. So, again, this ticks all of my boxes on organization, all of it. So this is what, again, a sample of what it could look like. And I love it because it goes to, if we don't see it, it doesn't exist, right? Um, if it's going to take somebody more than a few steps, they're not going to do it. And it's incredibly clear where they can find their information. Let's go to the next slide. All right. This shows a list of notebooks in an Evernote account. You can combine your notebooks into stacks which allows you to, as Leslie referred to earlier, to cubby size that information. It allows it to be corralled into a neat and contained space. 
one thing also you can do is be creative with your labeling, your notes, your notebooks, your stacks can also ha can have colorful emojis in the titles instead of just a text title. Your brain recognizes color faster than words. You can identify things without having to read each text title individually. So for those of us who have who are time blind or lagging time management skills, remember, not all this is absolutes, but what happens is we tend to live in two worlds. Because again, I want you to think of being time blind or not being aware of yourself in time. It's being on a boat, completely unmoored, not being able to see the horizon around you. So we're unsteady, right? We, we don't know where we sit in time. So what we like to do is, that what I like to say is you, there's only two types of time. It's like the now, like right now, right? Versus the not now, which is like way, way, way over there. And the not now could be a half an hour from now. It could be two days from now. It actually could be six months from now. And that's called future awareness. Knowing that something happening a ways away needs to be activated on now. Now, the good news is, as we get older, our future awareness brain grows, which is why your 13-year-old might only be able to see for next week, but you can see for six months. So let's talk about time a little bit. So here's how I talk about time. You have to be able to see time in order to learn how to manage it. And I know you're all coming to the table with very different time personalities. But here's, so when I really sat down to figure out how can I talk about time to a lot of people that are, are in all different places, this is what I felt. And time is my jam, just so you know. I'm a time management expert. I talk about time all the time. Time is very real. It is very tangible. I believe you can see time. And a lot of people think it's invi invisible. But you have to be able to see it to learn how to manage it. And to do that, you have to externalize it. Now, I'm not in my office at home right now. I'm actually in a hotel room. But if I was in my office, I would tell you that I have six ways that I externalize time. I have a wall calendar. I have an analog clock. I have a phone. I have a watch. I have an academic planner or a planner. I like to use an academic planner. And I also have a a timer. Now, at six ways in one room that I externalize time. But what that allows me to do is to internalize it. It allows me to see time, wait for it, move. And that's the key. So let's go to the next slide. So my number one tip for all of you that all of you can do, whether you're 8, 18, 38, or beyond, is you must be hanging analog clocks in every room you spend time in in your house including the bathroom, and I'm going to say, especially the bathroom, I'm hoping we're all friends here, because that's, well, that's where we get lost. But why analogs, right? Remember analogs? Remember those? And we've tend to gone, gone away with it. I'm looking for my, a lot of us are like, but I, but I, but I have on my, I'm, you know, what, Leslie, it's my phone. Like, why not? Why, why do I need an analog? Here's why. Let's go to the next. Because, and I know we're virtual. But here's the thing, you need to see time move. You need to see where you stand in relation to the rest of the day. You need to see 10 minutes went by, right? You, you, you need to see 20 minutes ago, 10 minutes going on, because time actually has a beginning, middle, and end. Remember that cubby size? It has a beginning, middle, and end. You have to see it, and digital only gives you one time, and that's the present. So if I was to ask you what time it is, you'd be able to tell me. But if I asked you to look and say, can you show me, you know, 20 minutes from now so you know how much time you have left, you can't do that on a digital. So I'm going to give you that as my number one, number two, and number three tip for all of you is, especially if you have children at home, hang clocks in every room that they're in and every room you're in, your kitchen, maybe you have a home office, even your office at work. You must be able to see time, elapsed time, future time, to see time in order to build that future awareness muscle. But here's what happens to our executive functioning brains, right? Our brains bore easily. 
They get brain drained very quickly. And what we're doing, and I'm kind of play acting here, looking for my, is we go, oh my goodness, how much more time do I have left? Maybe some of you are going right now. How much longer do I have to listen to her? I'm just kidding. Had a little humor there. And the first thing we're looking is something to tether us to time. And analog allows you to do that. Because if you can see that you only have five minutes left and see it, you can pause, you can picture done. And trust me, seeing done is super powerful. Because done is not only powerful, seeing done is not only powerful to stay the course, it's also really important to initiate. And then it allows us to pace ourselves. And when I explain this, what happened, I give this like tip in webinars, what happens, I literally get emails sometimes going, I didn't even think of it that way, Leslie, you were so right. I see myself like wiggling in my chair. I might move a pen or a book or a piece of paper, all to reactivate and re-energize my brain because I can see done. I can tether myself to time. Okay, let's go on to pillar number two. We have lots of, we're going to have, we have five pillars to cover. Okay, let's talk about focus, right? Sustaining that focus, being able to focus, staying on task, so to speak. Okay. That's, that's our next pillar, and we're going to go to the next slide. So here are two very quick tips that any of us can use. I am all about working time over task for so many reasons. The other thing that we have to remember is our brain gets flooded, those of us with either ADHD or weak EF, right? So if we say to our brain or we say to our child at home, hey, just go, go work on that report, or I'm just going to sit down and work on that report, or go finish, go get your math homework done before dinner. There's too much unknown there. That's actually a shelf, right? Where's the beginning, middle, and end? Where have I cubbied it? But if I put a time frame on it, that doesn't mean I might not be, I might not be done, but at least I understand 20 minutes. 20 minutes has a beginning, middle, and end. And again, I can see done, so I'm able to activate and stay the course. So always, if we were in person, I'd have you chanting, Time over task, time over task, because I want really that to like tether itself to your brain. So you remember it next time you, you sit down to do work on anything. And for my timer friends, I love timers. Not everybody does. I understand that. But for my timer friends, what I want you, I love timers because they hold future time, right? Out of your brain. But what I like about timers is I set them for odd amounts. I do not set anything in my world for 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Why? Because it's boring. And boring brains the dr brain drains the brain. And, and those of us who have EF, we need that dopamine hit. We need the brain to be active and engaged. So when we do things in odd amounts, it's a little quirky, right? It's a little different, but it's memorable and it's fun. Okay, two more quick focuses. Let's go to the next slide. Everybody good? All right. Okay, body doubling. Let's talk about body doubling. Um, and I know we have so many people, but um, we could do a quick raise hands if you've heard of body doubling. And I don't mean body doubling like an actor body doubling for another actor. Let me just do a quick, quick raise your hand if you um, have heard of this. This is my, one of my number go-tos for, for not even just kids, for adults. We all have a very, very hard time sometimes activating on things that are hard for us to do. And we find that when we're in the presence of somebody else who's anchoring us or mirroring us, right? Or sharing that cognitive load, not even doing the work for us, but just being there, we're able to activate and stay on class, stay on course. So what does it look like? It might look like if you're in an open office, you might want to, you might have somebody you want to sit next to um, because they're going to mirror, mirror you. So that will keep you focused to get the work done. The other thing is if you have a kid at home, they might be where you want to be or your partner or your caregiver, right? They might want to be in the kitchen or the dining room or somewhere where there doesn't always have to be a mirroring image. It doesn't always have to be, I'm on my computer, you're on my computer. It just might be that they need somebody else around them so that they can activate and stay the course. And there's actually an, um, a company called Focus Meet that you can literally hire someone to be on the other side of your video screen that will provide that body doubling for you. 
It's one of my absolute favorite, favorite tips. We see it in schools. We see it in offices. We see it. We see it. We used to see it in Starbucks before the pandemic. Love, 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 love. So body doubling should really be, you know, helps you lighten that load, helps you stay that course. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Let's talk about music. And if you're willing to play along, who wants to drop in the chat that they need to listen to music to get work done? Raise your hands. I see it. Good, 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 good. Okay, here's what I want to tell you about music. Music is real. Music really helps the brain. It helps the brain attend. It helps the brain plan. And it helps the brain initiate. Okay. I'm going to say it because I feel like we're all friends, right? I need to hear my, my 80s music to get me to move my body, to, right? I hear Gloria Gaynor, I hear Donna Summer, and I'm ready to go. And I am sure some of you out there plan your Peloton rides by what that music is going to be. But that I know that sounds funny, but, it's, but there's really something behind that. Because what the music can do is get you activated. But here's what I do with my music. So everybody heads up. And this can be for adults or students. A lot of you come to the table and tell me music is distracting. What I think is, and again, this is me, that the Shopify, the Shopify, I'm sorry, the Spotify switch up is distracting. I have my clients make playlists. Some of my students have a playlist for each subject. Some of them just have one. And that's what they play when it's time to sit down and get work done. Because when they hear the music, they activate, right? I hear it. It's time. I know what it is I'm supposed to be doing right now. It helps that brain get engaged and plan and initiate. But the other thing music does, which we weren't looking for initially, is music acts as a timekeeper. If you make a 30 something playlist, 35 minutes, 38 minutes, doesn't matter. And you roll through that playlist each time you sit down to do something. What your brain starts to say is, hey, that's the, I just heard the AVETs. I know I'm 20 minutes in. I'm sorry, you can now hear my music. Okay, hey, I'm 20 minutes in. Hey, I just heard Dawes. I know I'm in the home stretch. And that is very powerful brings us all the way back to the beginning, right? There's our scene done. There's our pause, picture, and pace. There's our cubby sizing our time. I don't want to keep going, but I want you to see where I sit on why music is so powerful for our brains when done correctly. Now, I love playlists. My only rule is that you're not putting new music on there, so you're not straining, right? Um, but I have people who listen to hip hop and Hamilton and everything in between. There's also um, people, there's something out there now. I know I haven't looked into it too much that there's brown noise. And there's also something called Brain FM, which is scientifically proven music that helps us either calm if we need calm, study if we need to study, focus if we need to focus. But music, if it is something you need, should really be in your rep repertoire for activation and focus. Okay, let's go to the next slide. This is effort, and effort is different than focus. What I like to say, particularly when I'm talking to students or parents, is like, I have this much information to get in this much time, right? And unfortunately, and I'm gonna get serious for a minute, in my world, and, I'm a, and maybe even in yours, this is where well, I like to say the perception of lazy lips. So a little fun fact about me, because I think it's important for you to get to know me a little bit, is remember, I coach mostly college students. So they come to me, they can say anything they want. They can use any four-letter word they want, right? Except for that one. That's a four-letter word I do not allow. I don't believe in lazy don't believe lazy because there's always something going on underneath the surface. So when people come to me, adults and kids, and say, X or Y thinks I'm lazy, I always say, you go back and you tell them that you just have a hard time sustaining effort. So let's talk about sustaining effort. Let's go to the next slide. There's a lot of things we can say about sustaining effort. Sometimes it's too much conversation. 
Sometimes it's too much overwhelm. Sometimes it's just too much. But what I want to bring to the table for you today, because again, we're spanning all ages and stages, is the understanding that the body and the brain are BFFs. Remember, I talk to students, so that's how I say it. They're BFFs because they were born literally out of the same cell. So any time we can put our whole selves in, right? We can make everything an experiential experience. It's going to keep our brains activated. So when you're sitting all day long or you're using only one modality, the likelihood that you are going to remember what you're working on or be able to activate what you're working on is very less likely than if we are having all different types of sensory experiences. So let's go to the next slide. So here's how I do everything. I do this for students and I even do this for adults. Anything you are sitting down to do, could be a project, could be studying, could be learning something. Let's say you're learning a new skill, right? Doesn't have to only be for kids, okay? I like you to have four quadrants. I like you to have a see it, a say it, a do it, and a hear it. And I like you to pick something from that, right? So that, or you have it all in one place. That's even more important too, is that it's not just, I have my see it over here and my hear it. I want you to have all these different experiential experiences and I want you to have them in one place because remember my organization tip that you can go to. So let's say you're learning how to cook. You can find audio snippets. You can have your videos that you're watching. You can have your printed materials. Or well, obviously you, you know, the do it might be, how you, can, you can even be writing something and take a screenshot of it. So that's what I want because you need to not drain that brain. That cognitive load gets very heavy when we're only using one. So let's go to the next slide and talk a little bit about Evernote. What you see here is the home dashboard within Evernote, which can be completely customized to allow your brain to have a multi-sensory experience, like Leslie was just referring to. See it, say it, do it, hear it. You can have leave yourself an audio recording in a note. You can have a pinned note with a video right in it. You can click right there. You can change the colors on your scratch pad to help your brain. There is also a task list widget, which can be added. You can integrate your Google Calendar. So everything is right here, right in front of you. What you see here is the home dashboard within Evernote which can be completely customized to allow your brain to have a multi-sensory experience. Like Leslie was just referring to. See it, say it, do it, hear it. You can have leave yourself an audio recording in a note. You can have a pinned note with a video right in it. You can click right there. You can change the colors on your scratch pad to help your brain. There is also a task list widget, which can be added. You can integrate your Google Calendar. So everything is right here, right in front of you. This is a game changer for my students. Kimberly, like have, being able to change things, customize it, being able to put all of these different things in, particularly when they're studying, it's, 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 I'm sorry. It, I always say that there's very few tech things that I can figure out. I, that's the other reason I have, I love Evernote because if I understand it and, and it's easy for me too, then it's then I can do it with. So I talk a lot in my work about work rituals or routines because, and here's what I mean. And this again goes right to our effort, <laughs> right? This goes right to our effort level. You would never go play a big soccer game right? Without warming up your body first. That's what I tell my students. So, and I guess, and again, this is for adults too. Work is a sport, right? Having to sit down and do a day's worth of work. Your brain is stone cold. Can you all see that? Your brain, there's nothing getting in there yet. So what I always like my students to do, or my adults, is come up with some type of work ritual that they go through that warms up the brain, that engages the brain, that gets the brain ready to go. 
So this is literally a work ritual from one of my students. And what she loves is she says, I, I open up my computer. I go to Evernote. My work ritual is right here. I go through these before I sit down to get work done. And now my brain is ready to receive. But the other fun fact about it, if you notice on the bottom, is it all, again, heads back to the music. So let's go to the next slide. You know, I'm all about, I said, I'm all about the playlist. Well, hello there. They now can even be less distracted because they don't have to go somewhere else. They can access their playlist right in Evernote. Um, and again, I'm all about if there's less places for them to look for things, they're going to do it. And the less places they have to turn right or left to find things, right? I want them to stay, I want them to stay on task. And as you know, our brains can easily get distracted. So love this, love this, love this. Okay, let's go to pillar number four, um, which is actually my favorite of all the executive functions. So this is working memory. And so the best way I know how to describe working memory, again, is to tell you what it's not. It's not short-term memory. It's not what you had for breakfast yesterday. And it's not long-term me memory where maybe you went to Disney with grandma for her 80th and the whole family came. Here's how I describe it. And I am going to use a student as the example. Your student is sitting in math class at eight o'clock in the morning. And in that moment and in that time, they are like on task. I get it. I get it. I'm good. I'm so good. But I want you now to fast forward 11 hours later. And that student opened up their book to do homework. And they're saying, and I'm sure you can all drop in the chat what they're saying. Okay. Got to keep it a little clean. They're going. I don't know what this is. I never learned this, right? I don't know what this is. That's working memory. What happened was, did that student listen? Yes. Did that student even learn? In that moment, yes. But what happened is they didn't remember. Because what working memory is, it's a two-lane highway. It's information that needs to come in and super glue to your brain. I want you to think of like a pole in the middle of your brain with Velcro all around it. And information has to stick because if it doesn't, it's gonna boomerang right back out. That's why for, our, for my students, we call it the boomerang brain. Again, we use funny terms that they can visualize and see. So it's information that has to come in but then it's information that you have to be able to retrieve and come back out. And that is really, really difficult, right? So we must have a place in our brain where that information, well, that's what working memory is, that information can go and stick. So let's go to the next slide. Again, here are just a few tips and tools on, on how we help to increase working memory. And looking at the time, I think I might even give you one more. Linking the unknown to the known is probably your best friend here. And I'm going to tell you why. So follow me. And, and, and if you have students at home, you're, the teachers actually do the, or if you remember your teachers doing this. But here's what I mean by this. The brain already has stored information. And when something new comes in, and I know I am speaking really, really layman, but that's how I, that's how I teach. Information has to find its friend. Where is it going, right? Otherwise, it's just free floating around. So we have to be asking ourselves questions like, what does this remind me of? Where have I maybe seen something like this before? Is this the same amount of time as it takes me to get to work? I do that a lot. I link even time to the known. So when we are looking in our brains for something, oh yeah, that's right, this reminds me of that. Boom, now I have a tethering piece. So any way you can link the unknown to the known, any way you can make connections, is going to help you solidify information, just is. Okay, the other thing is we've got to chunk it down. The brain needs to catch up. Well, we can, I saw someone just say, what about us non-students? You can do that too. Ask, we do a lot of self-reflection. What in my brain, what is it I know that this looks familiar to? What is it already that I might've seen this? The other thing is chunking it down. Chunk, chunk, chunk. You have to make things snippets of information because the brain only 
as you know, it has to catch up, right? Our working memory needs time for it to solidify. So we have to slow it down and only give it certain portions of information for it to be able to find its friend. So if we're talking, if we're giving instructions or someone is giving us instructions to us, getting it in sound bites or small amounts is much more helpful than too much information coming in our way. And the last one, and I was told I can do this, is for the parents at home. Because you're probably scratching your head going, what does she mean by stop answering questions when none were asked? So I'm going to give you this. This one is for my parents. And it doesn't matter if your child's 25, 20, or 8. I would bet any amount of money that your child shows up to you at some point and says things like, I'm hungry, or I'm thirsty. And we answer that statement by going, oh, you're hungry? Let me recite everything I just bought at Costco yesterday. There's this and there's that. But I want you to think about what I just said. So this is for you out there that are looking to maybe strengthen your child's working memory. I want to make that clear. Remember, all ages and stages, so I'm bringing different things for different people. So this one is for my parents who might have children at home that we want to help them get that working memory going. So believe it or not, when your child just says something to you like, I'm thirsty or I'm hungry, that working memory isn't working, meaning they're not using any kind of like working memory. But we are taking that opportunity and we're becoming their brains. We're reciting a list, let's say, of everything we have in the refrigerator for them. But if you think about it, your child did not ask you a question. So I want you, if your child comes to you and just says something, like I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I'm tired, I'm whatever it is, I want you to answer with a question. I want you to ask something like, is there something you need? Is there something you need from me? What is it you might want? Because being able to pull that information out of your head, I'm talking about children right now, is working memory. So we need to give them the opportunity to pull that information out. So I know that's funny and it's nuanced, but I know you're going to come back to me and you're going to go, now that you brought it to my attention, it happens all day long in my house. They're not asking me. They're saying I'm thirsty and I'm handing them over the water pitcher. So please, give. that's how you're going to give them an opportunity to grow their working memory. Okay. Let's talk a little about how we use Evernote in our working memory. So let's go to the next slide. Well, here's something that has always struck me. David Allen, who is a um, productivity guru, so to speak. I hate the word guru, but um, he, his main concept, his main idea is that your mind is for having ideas, not holding them. Think about it. You're walking around the house like I do all the time. And it's like I constantly have these thought bubbles popping up over my head. Of, I have to do this. I have to do that. I have to do this. I have to do that. Well, who's going to remember all that? By the time I walk down the hallway, I've forgotten half of them. However, what do I always have with me? My phone. Evernote is the perfect place to grab those little things as they happen and put them somewhere so that you can address them either with the web clipper or I'm loving the new mobile widgets where you literally, it takes one click on your phone to be able to open up a new note or even like do an audio recording to yourself. You get some of these out of your head so you can actually start to think about other things that matter instead of, oh my God, I have to buy cat food. Oh my God, it's my mother's birthday tomorrow. I haven't gotten a birthday card yet. You know, kind of thing. It's it's having Evernote is one of those places where you can take all of these things and put them somewhere. Right. I have, I'm on your page. The whole offloading and, and not having to crowd our brains with things that we could put in another place, I think is 
you know, we see it with adults, we see it with students, it's absolutely the game changer. Just using it as our offloaded, I'm sorry, our outboarding brain or offloading information, um, which is an interesting thing because what I see also is that um, I am seeing more and more, I remember I work with parents and students, I'm seeing them do that. I'm seeing them take all of those minor things that they might have forgotten or things they have to do and all of them are offloading it into Evernote and only now having Evernote as their one place to go to. It's like, well, how are you going to remember to remember is a question we say all the time to help our working memory. How are you going to remember to remember that? And now what's happening is the answer is I'm going to go to Evernote. Mm -hmm. Really awesome. As opposed to, oh, I'm going to go find my phone or check where did I put in my notes? Did I take a screenshot? Did I take a photo, right? It's now, all right, remember the going back all the way to that one, that being in one place or having more than, you know, a few steps to do something. So it just allows our brain to be free to do what it needs to do. It's really very, it's a really, to me, Evernote is like the, the working memory portion of our brain. It's very cool. And again, now with the new mobile widgets, like I said, you know, like you had mentioned before that, you know, I mean, it, it, having to take two or three steps to do something or to get that information into another spot, you know, you're, you're going to lose a lot of people right there. Where, you know, with the widgets now, you, I mean, it's literally on your home screen. It, it's like one click. So it, I think it's fantastic. In our, the, the way everyone these days is just moving so quickly to have to stop and open up an app and go and find where you're going to put it. You don't have to think about it. Right. And I and I did a funny poll. I asked my students like, okay, tell me what your favorite thing is. And interestingly, the biggest thing that they love is, you know, not all our students anymore have textbooks. A lot of them particularly have these heavy PowerPoints that they get. Being able to put that in Evernote and being able to write there or like annotate or highlight or have it all in one place. I call it like leaving breadcrumbs, right? It's like you're, you know, you're leaving those like little breadcrumbs, but being able to highlight and annotate right there is that for me as a coach, it makes, makes my job a little bit easier. So I love that. Let's go to the next slide because we have one more and then we're going to take some questions. Okay. Pillar number five is action. And some of you might know it as impulsivity. And again, it's not a word I like to use um, for obvious reasons. It just has a very negative um, connotation. I like to use the word self-leadership because again, with self, self with the self-leadership, I feel like it you have more control and you hopefully have more self-awareness. And also there's somewhere to go with self-leadership, right? You can always improve. You can always strengthen. You can always get better. Um, some people call it neuro versus naughty, like what's leading what? And I'm here to tell you that it's always brain based. That it's not that we just want to we just want to be inactive or we want to be impulsive. It's our brain is really doing what it's what it's doing. So again, coming up with the thing that I wanted to talk about. So here's how I discuss right. Here's my, my fix. So let's go to the next slide. For me, it's all about movement. So one time I was doing a webinar and someone asked me, what do I feel is the opposite of distractibility? And I actually said, I feel movement is. Again, this is me. I've been in the field for 19 years. That isn't research proven. That's Leslie proven or Leslie theory. Because I see it even with my own way. If I am sitting too long and I am draining my brain and I'm only working, let's say, on one thing or in one modality, my brain starts to bore. It starts to get tired. It stops doing what it's supposed to be doing. And it needs that dopamine hit. Oh, let's see what's going on on Nordstrom.com. Sorry, that might be mine. You all probably have another one of your own. So what happens with movement it, it, it helps that brain from not feeling like it has that 100-pound boulder on. It manages our impulses. It helps our effort and focus, right? Think about it, standing up, sitting down. How many of you feel, right? When you stand, all of a sudden, the energy comes back. 
But the other thing movement does is it helps us lay down learning. Okay, I want you to all think back of when you really need to lay down your learning and or memorize something or really understand something. What's the best way to do it? You're pacing. You're going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. I want you to think about it. It's much harder for us to lay down learning or learn something when we're just sitting, right? I hope some of you are standing. I hope some of you are walking around listening to this. And the other thing it helps us recall calls memory. But I see it with my with with both students and adults and I swear to you this to be true. I used to put students in the bathtub or move them around the house to do homework. No water because the bathtub was cold. Sensory seeking. Cozy. Great place to get work done. I have adults who bring work home and hop in that bathtub. I have graduate students who wrote their whole thesis in the bathtub. So again, it helps the distractibility. It helps manage the impulsivity. Movement is just good for everybody and everything. And it's really, really good for the brain. I hope that all, as we move to our Q&A slide, um, I hope that gave you a little bit of more of an understanding of what executive functions really are. And I'm hoping some of you saw a few things in yourself or whoever might be in your household. And you even like got a few little nuggets um, to try. So this one's for Kimberly. What um, what do you do when, if you're the type of person who feels really overwhelmed when trying something new, but you want to get, you want to stick with it and get started with Evernote? What's, what do you recommend? My biggest recommendation is to not be afraid of it. So many people, almost every single client I have ever had when I was a professional organizer and then went into productivity, the first question I always get is, what are the rules? There are no rules. The rules are what works for you. You need to figure out, you know, figure out a naming convention for your titles. Decide if you want to use emojis. Decide if you want to um, have, a, have a, put a date on each one. Just like there's no rules. And then the second best part to that is you can change your mind. Like, I don't know about you, but like, have you ever moved into a house and you're like, oh, I'm going to paint the bedroom stage green, which I did one time. Hated it. You know what? You buy a new can of paint. You redo it. Like, I think there's very little in life that can't be changed. They can't be fixed. If you decide that the way you started to set up your notes and your notebooks and your stacks and all that fun stuff didn't work for you, change it, do it a different way, figure out the way. And it may take a little bit to figure that out, but you'll figure that out. I mean, if you, you know, you can always have somebody who, who uses it or, hey, shameless plug, one of the certified experts, we're there, we're there to help. Um, Evernote has a fantastic user forum. You can ask other users questions. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that's like my biggest thing. It's just like, don't be afraid of it. Just jump in. And if you want to change it, change it. And then you can always, I mean, you know, periodically every 10 years or so, I basically take all of my stuff and wipe it into an archive and then kind of start fresh. So it just frees my brain up to, ooh, I'm going to start over. My last question, because uh, I know we're very close to the end here, is for Leslie. Um, this is a question I get asked a lot. Um, so there might be some people on the call that feel this way, but uh, a lot of what you said might be relatable to someone who didn't realize that they may or may not have ADHD. Um, they've never been diagnosed before. If they suspect they might have ADHD, what do you recommend? What I recommend is going to a medical professional. Um, I have to say this. Um, I'm on a lot in a lot of groups and a lot of people write, hey, I have these symptoms. Do you think, do you think I have ADHD or executive dysfunction? And everyone becomes like the expert. Go to an expert. Go to go to see someone that specializes in it. Go to see a neurologist. Go see a psychiatrist who can run like who can talk you through some of the, the touch points, but your first line should be absolutely going to a medical professional. Coaches do not diagnose. So you really wanna make sure that you find somebody who specializes in executive functioning or ADHD.